Good evening, guys. Hello. Hola, however you say it in French. Um, bonjour, yes. If you guys will still uh, stand up and pray with me before we start worship. Dear Lord, I just thank you for today. Thank you for the sun shining, warming us up. Lord, I just pray that uh, you allow us to open our hearts to you tonight, Lord, and our minds so that uh, we may receive the message that you have planned for us upstairs and downstairs. Amen. Amen. Why you ever chose me It's always been a mystery All my life I've been told I belong At the end of the line We thought the other not quite We thought I'd never get it right But it turns out you're the one I was looking for all this time I'm just a nobody Trying to tell everybody all about somebody who saved my soul Ever since you rescued me You gave my heart a song to sing I'm waiting for the world to see Nobody but Jesus I'm waiting for the world to see Nobody but Jesus well, Moses had stage fright David brought a rock to a sword fight You picked twelve outsiders Nobody would have chosen to change the world Well, the moral of the story is Everybody's got a purpose So when I hear that devil start talking to me Saying, who do you think you are? I say, I'm just a nobody Trying to tell everybody What about somebody who saved my soul Ever well, since you rescued me You gave my heart a song to sing I'm waiting for the world to see Nobody but Jesus I'm living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus So let me go down, down, down in history Here's another blood ball Faithful member of the family And if they all forget my name Well, that's fine with me I'm living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus So let me go down, down, down in history There's another blood for a faithful member of the family I'm living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus I'm just a nobody Trying to tell everybody All about somebody Who saved my soul Ever since you rescued me You gave my heart a song to sing I'm living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus I'm living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus I'm living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus to say 
what will I say when I'm held to the flame like I am? I know you're able and I know you can Slave through the fire with your mighty hand But even if you don't My hope is you alone Say it only takes a little faith God, when you choose to leave mountains unmoved, oh, oh, give me the strength to be able to sing it as well with my soul. I know you're able and I know you can. Save through the fire with your mighty hand. They have a talent for you. One of these days, you're going to say, hey, time to shine. And I want to thank you for that. And we, we don't know your plan, but your plan is amazing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs> Great job.
Well, I just want to echo what she said. That was good. Actually, I'll take the mic off. It's all you tonight. <laughs> no, I think that's right. Everyone's got a talent out there. God's equipped you and called you and given you a purpose. And you never know when it's your time to shine. <laughs> I don't want to embarrass somebody who's in the house tonight, but I don't know if you had the privilege to listen to Matt's, I don't want to call it testimony, but I guess testimony from Sunday service. Amen. It was powerful. <laughs> it's amazing to see what God does in people's lives, right? That we can go from, yeah, glory to God. If we can go from who we were to a new creation in Christ Jesus, just quoting scriptures like you wouldn't believe it, right? I thought that was awesome. So thank you all for joining us in-house tonight. Thank you for joining us online. Uh, if, if you're joining us online, just throw a heart emoji in the chat. That way we know you're here and we just want to connect with you a little bit. So as they go into the other room and close the door, we're just going to open in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you tonight, and we thank you that by the blood of Jesus, we are made new. In the book of Hebrews, it talks about that it wasn't by the blood of bull and goats, but by the blood of your precious son, Jesus Christ, that we are made new. God, we thank you that you sent your son that God himself came down to take our place. And God, if you value us that much, we know that we're here with a purpose. So God, tonight I just pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I pray that you would just, just settle our hearts, settle our minds right now so that we could just tune into what your Spirit's saying. God, I pray tonight that I wouldn't speak out of my own mind and heart, but I would speak out of the heart of God. Because, Lord, I have such a burden to bring forth your word tonight, and I just pray that I would fulfill what you called me to do. I pray that the truth of your word would be spoken, and that we would leave here changed by the power of your word. So, God, open our hearts, open our minds. We just want to receive everything you have for us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the title of my sermon tonight... It's called, What Does It Mean to Be a Disciple? So this is a little bit different than Pastor Jay's series he has going on about the life of David, which has blessed me. I don't know about you guys, but I was like, after every sermon, I think I turn around and go, wow, that's just what I needed to hear. <laughs> wow, that's exactly what I needed to hear. So that's really blessed me. Um, I have a little bit different, different um, road I want to go down tonight. I wanted to open with a question. I heard this analogy that someone um, shared at a leadership retreat we were at, and they asked, are you carrots, are you eggs, or are you coffee beans? And she said that I had the same exact look, the, the dog turning its head to the side like, er, what? <laughs> she said, let me explain, you know, like when life happens, right, it's like boiling water in a pot. Just imagine yourself right now in a kitchen with a pot of boiling water, right? And you throw carrots in the pot. What happens to carrots? Carrots, when you throw them in boiling water, they go from hot or from really hard to soft. They soften up, right? So for some of us, when life happens and life gets hard, when the heat's turned up, when the pressure turns up, right, we go from hard into being into more soft and pliable. Some of us are like eggs, right? Who here likes eggs? Guy Fieri, if he's watching, I'm hoping. He hates eggs, but that's okay. He's still like an amazing chef. <laughs> I watch way too much Food Network. But um, eggs, right? So you have an egg, you throw it in the boiling, boiling water, and what happens to an egg? Yeah, that's something that's soft on the inside and it actually hardens up. Right? So when life happens, some of us go from being real soft and we harden up. We get tougher, right? But then coffee beans are a whole different story. If you got a bag of coffee beans and you dump it in a pot of boiling water, guess what? They turn into something altogether all different. They release something from inside themselves 
that changes the atmosphere around them. Right? Who here likes coffee? Anybody in the coffee house, right? It's, it's interesting because coffee beans don't just get changed by what happens to them, but they change what's going on around them. So as we think about that, as we're going through what we're going through right now, as we're walking out our walk of faith in life, let's ask ourselves, how do we respond to what's going on in life? Do we get hard and toughen up, or do we get soft and pliable? Or if we go on into maturity, are we the type of people that can change our surroundings? Right, so I do a lot of leadership training for store leaders at where I work. And one analogy I always like to ask is, are you a thermostat or a thermometer? So if you've heard that before, that's, it's kind of a, you're like, what? <laughs> that's another one of those, like, what? Until you get the analogy. So there's lots of people who are thermometers, right? A thermometer reads what's going on around it, and it says, oh, it's hot, it's cold, right? So a lot of times stuff happens in the store. We work in customer service and retail, so there's all kinds of scenarios that you're like, you wouldn't believe what happened. Or you wouldn't believe what's going on. There's this problem in the industry or this and that. And people always go, oh, this is happening. It's like, that's great. All of us can be aware of what's happening around us. Right? That's what a thermometer does. Oh, it's hot. It's 72. A thermostat, you go to a thermostat, you push up the volume or you push you know, down the temperature and it changes the atmosphere. Right? And we always say that's what leaders are. Leaders are thermostats. Yep. It might be hot, but guess what? We're going to turn on the AC and we get to change the environment. So I feel like that's the same analogy for disciples. Right? Disciples of Jesus Christ, they'd walk into a town and they would have an effect. They would bring the word. They would preach the gospel. They would heal some people. And then all of a sudden, things just started changing. The, the spiritual atmosphere was changed by the disciples of Jesus Christ. Uh, so if you're, if you're studying the book of Acts, right? That sounds amazing, but... The good news is that didn't stop in the book of Acts. I go back and Peter said in his sermon in Acts 2, he said, this is for you. And he's talking about the Holy Spirit and the saving works of grace. He said, this is for you, for your children, and for all who are far off, and as many as the Lord would call. <laughs> Some people say, oh, that stuff's just done with. Well, I found real comfort when I was starting to learn about the Holy Spirit. I read that, and I was like, oh, Peter's pretty clear here. He says, for you. Okay, for your children, all right. For all who are far off, so people all over the world. And he said, for as many as the Lord would call. So that means us today, too. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that. If you'd open up your Bibles to Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20. So Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. And the reason I talk about that is, I know we're in a season of transition the last time I was in the pulpit, I talked about Joshua standing before the walls of Jericho, about to lead the army in, and he had all of his past behind him, all the years of wandering, right? And there were people that would get left behind in the wilderness. And then there were new people that he was going to march into the promised land with and inherit the promises of God. And I feel like that's where we are as a church, this church, and probably the church in general. And I'm worried that there's a lot of people who want to go back. Right? I don't know if you've uh, read you know, the first five books of the Bible, but the children of Israel, as they're about to enter the promised land, there's a couple tribes that are like, all right, cool, we're about to go in. Um, we'll come in and we'll fight, but then we're going to go back. And they're like, what? Oh, yeah, yeah, there's nice land out there. I don't know if we walked through that. Were you there? Yeah, it's real nice out there. Yeah, it seems nice, good land for farming. Yeah, I think we're just going to go back after that. And they were like, how, how could you do that? God gave us this land. And some people were just willing to settle for what looked good and not inherit the promises of God. And I feel like in the church, I've seen that happen with some people um, in general and also some people who I was, I thought like maybe a year and a half ago, I was like, this person's going to be leading the way. They're the ones who are going to like push forward through all the hardships I thought they would be leading the way, and now they're some of the people who are like, actually, I'm just going to settle back there. And I'm not going to lie, a couple weeks ago, I was kind of disheartened by that. I was like, some people are stepping back now? Like, after all we've been through, now you want to go back? Like, you should have quit before all the hard stuff. <laughs> you know, like, don't walk 40 years in the wilderness and then give up. Like, give up in Egypt. Like, <laughs> give up before you have to go through all that work, you know. 
and I'm kidding, don't give up. Don't give up at all. But you know what I'm saying? Like, now is not the time to quit. Because God's called us to so much more. If, if I could have any heart in my message tonight, I would say that's what, that's what I want to preach about, is God's calling us to so much more. Amen. Okay, and that's what he talks about in Matthew 28. Matthew 28, verse 18 says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I know a lot of people have heard this scripture. It's a very common section of scripture. It's called the Great Commission. Um, when I was doing training for life group leaders, I would, <laughs> I would start on every Zoom that we did with the scripture. And not just because it's really cool, but that this should be our focus as life group leaders, as leaders, as disciples in the kingdom of God. And I want to say, if you're in this room right now, raise your hand if you're in this room right now. Raise your hand if you're online at home watching. You're a leader, all right? Amen. Like right now, you're a leader in the kingdom of God. You might think like, really, me? Yeah, you. <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit later. I'll just share it now. There's some statistics that right now, the average person attends church one Sunday out of five. Average. Like you're considered really committed if you go more often than to church one out of every five weeks. Like, you are committed. Like, everyone here comes pretty much every week, right? So you guys are weird, <laughs> according to the world standards. But being weird is good. That's a good thing. You guys are the committed crowd. So like I said, you're leaders. And this is the same, Jesus says the same thing to us today, speaking to his disciples. We're his disciples. And I want to break this down. Verse 18, he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. I was like, wow, that's a powerful statement. If you want to look it up in the Greek, the word all means all, right? You don't even have to, like, double-check that one. All authority. So what's he say? He says, go, therefore. So that's the commissioning. He's sending us out to do what? To make converts, right? Just get people saved. Just get them to the altar once. Oh, no, actually, it says more than that. He says, to make disciples. Who knows being a disciple is a whole lot more than just saying a prayer once at an altar, or, you know, at youth camp, like, oh, I gave my heart to the Lord one time at youth camp or, you know, at a revival service. Like, being a disciple is a whole different level of commitment. But not only is it a commitment to be disciples, but look what he says. He says, of all nations. Does that challenge you a little bit? He doesn't just say to your next door neighbor or the guy Larry at work who's kind of nice who you think might be able to listen to you. He says, of all nations. I think Jesus is challenging the scope of our vision of the impact that we can have in people's lives. And it's not just for like TV preachers on the big networks who can have the impact of the world, but you never know who you're going to be having an influence in and the impact that they can have in someone else's life. He says to baptize them. So obviously baptisms are really important, but I wanted to emphasize what he says next. He says teach. We have to teach people. That's what he's called us to do. And not just, you know, me and the pulpit to teach people. But he says, teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you. I thought that was cool. He says, hey, I'm gonna, I've given you commands and stuff to do. Go teach other people how to do that. Well, how do you do that, right? It's not just like, hey, you need to get your act together. <laughs> hey, you need to quit sinning. You know, the guys out smoking on their smoke breaks, you walk up and say, hey, quit smoking. And it's like, no, that's not what God's telling us to do. The way that we show what God's commanded us to do is through our actions as we live out the gospel. It's not about hitting people over the head with scriptures and, you know, quit doing this and quit your drinking and quit your sinning and cussing and carrying on, right? It's living out the gospel. Right? I like that. I was like, okay, you know, I, I don't always know the right thing to say. I know what you're thinking. Like, I'm sure you could make up for it with volume. But, you know, I don't always know the right thing to say. But sometimes it's just being there with people. Like, more of the opportunities that I've had to be a witness in the past, I don't know, like, year and a half weren't in me saying, like, wonderful, deep things and just having the right words. It was like, hey, when people had awful stuff happen and the rubber hits the road and they're like, hey, I really need to talk. 
yep, I'm here for you, what's up? You know, I can't tell you, like I said, I said amazing things that made them feel better. So it was just being there with people. In the past week, there were some family things that happened that were just awful, like really scary stuff in my family. And all I could do with some people is, hey, I'm praying for you right now, and I've talked to some other people. We're praying in agreement right now that this is going to turn out well. Amen. So no, no magic words, but it did. And we thought, hey, there, this person in my family might need some very extensive, scary surgery. We're like, oh, no, what's going to happen? We don't know. And then all of a sudden, like, oh, actually, it was, it was not that bad. They're doing better already. It's like, oh, praise God. <laughs> right? It's like he still answers prayer. So... I think that's what being a disciple is like. And I'm not just saying that like, oh, do what I do. And that's what being a disciple is like. But it's a lot of those smaller things that in the moment are huge. Right? We think, oh, I got to fly to Africa and feed a thousand children and build 20 orphanages. You know, it's like, I, I don't know. I can't do that. If you're going to fly me to Africa to build a building, we're in trouble. <laughs> like, I can swing a hammer, but don't, don't ask me to build a building. Like, that's not my specialty. <laughs> but if you need someone to pray on the phone with you, that I can do. So I know I'm talking about me a lot, but I'm just kind of just sharing my heart tonight. I hope that's all right. So, and and last but not least, he says he's with us. I thought that's the best thing. Like, he's not just sending you out like, all right, go get him. I'm going to hang out back in headquarters. Go get him, soldier. Rush out to the front lines in the battle. He's like, no, I'm with you. Let's go get this together. So how do we apply this, right? So I want to do an exercise. All right, so we're going to do something you tell little kids not to do. Get your pointer finger out, right? All right, get your pointer finger out. Ready? So I'm going to ask you, who is in charge of your spiritual growth? Point at that person. It's not a trick question. <laughs> All right. Yeah, okay, maybe that's a good answer. Maybe up, right, Jesus. Of course, having a good relationship with God. So some people would probably point to the pulpit and say, oh, the pastor is in charge of my spiritual growth. Thankfully, I have to say, I think everybody in this building pointed at themselves, right? We're in charge of our own spiritual growth. So I wanted to share a little bit of a, uh, uh, well, it's not a statistic, but in our MIP course, they did a survey where they were talking about, um, they surveyed a thousand churches and they asked, what is the purpose of your church? And in response, 89% of the churches said that the purpose of the church was to meet their needs. Yeah, when I said that, I was like, wow, to meet their personal needs. Like, hey, the church should make me feel better. The church should provide for me. And 11% said to reach the world. I was like, wow, we got our priorities a little bit out of, out of line, don't you think? So they asked, whose job is it to see that these two things happen, that your needs are met, and um, that the, the world is reached? 93% said it was the job of the pastor. And again, this is a thousand churches. Like, even if they're small churches, that says a lot. I think so often it's easy as a Christian, right? Like, oh, well, someone else, like the pastor, they should do it. They're, you know, super spiritual, way smarter, you know, whatever. And I'm not saying that, obviously, you know me. <clears throat> But we, we, we tend to think that, right? Like, it can't be on me. Like, God wouldn't use me for that kind of stuff. That's big, important stuff, and it's just little old me. Like, tonight I want to scrap all the little old me, that, you know, that voice that pops up in our head whenever an opportunity comes up. Um, A.W. Tozer, in his book, The Crucified Life, had a really good quote. He said, doesn't it seem strange that the generation with the most advanced technology and the easiest to read Bible translations is the weakest generations of Christians in the history of our country. Church attendance has never been lower, and the Christian influence in our culture has never been weaker. I was like, wow, <laughs> brutal. And I don't say that to be like condemnation, but this it's kind of true, right? We have like 10,000 translations on our phones, and it's the heart. We're like, we struggle to use the word of God the most. So I think the problem is like there's, there's always a high standard to be a disciple, um, in the book of James, James chapter 2, verses 18 to 20. I'm going to read two verses of that. So we're all Christians who have faith. But James says in James 2, verse 18, But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, 
and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe, and they tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that with, with that faith without works is dead? So I know that's kind of like a controversial thought, like, okay, we're not saved by doing faith or by doing good works alone. But I think the point of what James is saying is like you can't just like say, like, oh yeah, I believe in God and stuff, but I still live awful. You know, I live like the devil. <laughs> you know, I think that was a temptation back then, but I think it's even more so in the world. Like we never we've never had more culture of the world available to us. Like the whole culture of the world is available in a smartphone, and we can pull up anything and be immediately exposed. You know, even like little kids nowadays have phones, and they keep getting younger and younger that get phones. And I know I, I work in the you know wireless, so kids younger and younger are exposed to even more of the world. And I'm not just talking about like oh the evil world, but they just know more stuff. Like I know, and this is I'm not even that old, but I didn't get an email until I was like late in high school. I didn't even use it like that much. Until I got into college, I was like, oh, I need to do this. Like, I should really use an email. Nowadays, you're like six and you have an email. You know, like six years old, have like three emails and an iPhone. Like, I had to learn how to use a smartphone. And I was like, oh, boy. I thought I was really cool with my slider phone. Anybody have a slider phone where you're like, <laughs> you like, you had the little keyboard. You're like, oh, yeah. I don't have to do that. Dun, 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 dun. You know, now there's just so much more culture and technology available to people. And it's hard not to be influenced by that. And then when you want to act out your faith, you have to stand out against that, and you have to move against that sometimes. That when the world says, hey, everyone's doing this, that you have to be, well, I'm not going to do that. Why not? Well, I'm just not going to do that. That's not who I am. Like, that's the challenge, right? And that's what James is talking about. That When we have faith, it's all about how we live it out. But A.W. Tozer talked about that. He, he talked about that people struggled because they have something called mental assent. It's like the idea that, you know, we're in church and we learn about God and we know all the stuff. Like, I could tell you about this, you know, the stories and all that stuff, but knowing is not enough. Like, when you get to heaven, God's not like, all right, here's the test. Do you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, it's not like a knowledge test. It's do you believe him? You know, but the danger is like, oh, I know enough, so I'm good. I'm a good person, right? We're going to turn to Matthew 7, verse 21 to 24. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. So again, he just reaffirms, it's not just about what we know, it's about what we do. So I wanted to read another scripture in Luke 13, verses 22. And uh, I was at a Bible study one time. <laughs> And um, we were talking about, like, you know, how do we evangelize and how do people get saved? And uh, there was a guy who's a former pastor, and he, like, tried to refute me when I, when I talked about this verse. He's like, no, no, that's not what it's talking about. And I was like, well, this is what it says. So Luke 13, um, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of, oh, sorry, hold on, 13, Luke 13, just seeing if you're paying attention. Luke 13, 22 says, Then Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching. So again, what's the Great Commission? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and teaching them to obey everything. Jesus is our example. He did the same thing. He was teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. And someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? Wow, that's a tough question, right? We're called to be disciple makers, teach people. Is it going to work? And I love this is what he says to them. Verse 24. Make every effort to enter through the narrow door. Because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, 
You will stand outside and knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door to us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. So again, it's not just about personal knowledge of like, oh yeah, I know all the, the creeds and I understand the Bible. It was, do you know him? I know I've stood up before and I've talked about like the president, right? A lot of people could tell you about the president, Biden, 46. I don't know, he's like 78 years old, right? He was in Congress. They could tell you all about him. I know about him, but do you know him? Like if you went up to the White House, would he invite you in and let you sit down and have dinner with him? There's a difference between knowing about and actually knowing him. And that's the difference. That's the difference of what disciples are. <clears throat> so I know we're called to a higher standard. I'm going to turn to Mark 8. So we've got a lot of scripture tonight. If you're at home, I hope you're having fun turning through your Bible. Mark 8, verse 34. It says, when he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So that's a really cool verse, like take up your cross and follow me. <laughs> then one time I realized, I was like, where is he going? <laughs> a lot of people don't talk about that. Like, yeah, I carry my cross. And it's like, where is Jesus going? No, he's going to his death. Right? I think that's the promise of the Christian life. It's like, Super, it seems almost sad and heavy, like, oh, yeah, we're, Jesus is taking his cross and he's going to his death. Like, that seems sad and heavy, but I want to switch that around. How does a disciple think about this? This is absolutely the greatest news we have, <laughs> right? We stand on the other side of Easter looking back at resurrection, but where was Jesus going? He was going to die, and he rose again. That's the same thing with us. I don't know about you, but I have, like, a past. I've sinned. We all have, like... Right? Who here has ever sinned in that? Right? All of us. There's a lot of things that if I were standing before God and I had to be perfect to get into heaven, I'm not going to cut the mustard. But I thank God that I get to put all that in the ground. That the old man, right, he's buried and he's dead. And there's a new creation in Christ Jesus. Is anybody else excited about that? Amen. Yeah. That's the hope of the resurrection, right? We're a new creature in Christ Jesus. The old things have passed away. All things are made new. So when we're disciples, we think, oh, I got to give up all this stuff. Like, remember that the stuff you're giving up isn't that great. Like, I can tell you, like, all the hopes and dreams I had before I really started following God, I had to give them up. And some people thought I was nuts in my life. Like, some people still think I'm nuts, and that's fine. But, like, for real, they're like, you're weird. Why would you not do this, Luke? What's wrong with you? Why are you throwing your life away? And making certain decisions. Like, really, that people would say those things to me and just gossip. And, but I'm telling you now, like, everything that I had to give up, like, all the dreams, and I was like, oh, this is what I really want. All that stuff I gave up now, and I'm like, why? Like, what God's put me now is way better. Like, way better than I could have thought for myself. You know, so I just want to encourage everybody. I don't know what you're going through right now. I don't know where you're at, and God's asking you to give up something. Or maybe it's to stay in a spot and endure and not just go and move and do what you want, but stay and be faithful. I want to encourage you that if he's asking you to give something up as a disciple, that, that's where he's changing you. That's where the old's passing away. All those dreams that are, are dying, they have to die. All the things that get forsaken and dead, right? It says, unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it can't bring forth new life. If he's taking something away, it's because he wants to give you something better. So like for real, if you're, if you're in, a, in a situation or a relationship where it's just not what you want it to be and you're praying like, God, I wish you would just change this. The best thing I can tell you is that he's trying to change you into who you need to be. Right. So I'll give you an example. I know, I know it sounds like, yeah, well, you should say that, Luke, right? Just stay faithful. Just believe God and stick it out. Like, I'm not just saying that as just like a good Christian bumper sticker kind of a thing. Um, so let me give you an example. Who here has ever, like, lifted weights or anything? Right? Okay, so if you're trying to build a muscle, you, like, lift weights. And sometimes it's um, not the amount of weight. You know, it's not like I did 6,000 pounds. Sometimes it's like, you know, I had 100 pounds and I held it. Like, have you, any of you ever done that? Or like you just hold like a weight up or you hold, even if you hold your arms up 
after like a, you know, a while, you're like, my arms are real heavy. I'm not this buff, but my arms are real heavy. Right? So sometimes the greatest strength is how long you can endure under pressure. Like that's one of the fundamentals of like weightlifting and bodybuilding. They call it like time under tension. So the greatest strength we can exhibit as Christians sometimes is how long can we stay under tension? So if you think about it, the greatest strength we have sometimes is patience. So I know you might be thinking like, well, you don't understand. <laughs> Maybe I don't understand. Like I don't know everyone's situation. But I'm telling you, if God's asking you to stay in a situation as uncomfortable it is, and he's asking you to be patient, that's a strength that he's building in you. He's building you to be a warrior for him. <laughs> and there's no way that there's like, there's no easy way. There's no steroids in the spiritual kingdom, right? So sometimes it's just being faithful and building that strength that when you get on the other side of it, other people are like, how'd you do it? And you're like, I don't know. Like, I believe God and just stuck it out and it's all good now. And other people be like, well, that's amazing. There's no way I could have done that. And you're like, I didn't think I could either, but God did it. He worked it all out. Like, um, like for being at this church as an example, like I never thought I would be in this church and I definitely never thought I would be behind the pulpit. But there are things that like God asked me to do and I was like, I'll trust you, but that, that's weird, you know, or I wouldn't have thought of that. And I'm here to tell you that the greatest things that have happened in my life, I couldn't have made it happen. Like, I couldn't have been like, okay, here's my, you know, three-point plan. I'm, it's a smart goal. It's specific. It's measurable. It's attainable. It's relevant, and it's time-bound, and I accomplished it all, you know, and I had good accountability to get it done. That's not how it happened. It happened like, okay, I just trust God and kept going. And I was tired, but then I just kept going and putting one foot in front of the other, and then all of a sudden, we were here. <laughs> you know, and then all of a sudden, like, my marriage is really good. You know, and all of a sudden, we want kids, and we can't have kids, and then we have kids. And it's like, okay, <laughs> God is so faithful. Amen. And that's the life of the disciple. Like, it doesn't always make sense with what you see. It doesn't always work out the way you thought it would work out. Like, there are things that you pursue, and it's like, oh, that didn't go how I thought it would go. But it's not always, like, you know, they say it's not always just the destination. It's the journey along the way. Like the disciples on the road of Emmaus walking with Jesus, right? It wasn't about getting to Emmaus. They were walking with Jesus. And he's telling them all these stories. And they're like, we got to meet this guy, right? <laughs> we got to learn more about who he's telling us about. And that's the same thing for us. So, I, I, again, I know it's not like the most well-organized sermon I've ever preached. But, like, that's the life of a disciple, and, yeah. So hopefully this kind of realigns our, realigns our thoughts. So I wanted to ask, like, is what we're doing having eternal significance? You know, that's something I've been thinking a lot about. Like, what does it mean to be a, you know, a minister? And we're all called to be ministers. There's scriptures, like, we're all given the ministry of reconciliation. But what does it mean? You know, there have been, like, I'm, if I'm being honest, and again, Please, like, I'm not complaining, just being transparent. My, I have no time right now. I'm so overwhelmed with things going on and um, burdens and, like, more family problems and health problems with people I love have happened in the past two weeks than have literally happened for, like, six months. And, I'm, again, I'm not complaining because at one point I was so tired in one night. And then all of a sudden God, like, just clicked it on in me. He's like, but this is what you're here for. And I was like, oh, Yeah. And literally, all like the stress and the anxiety and all this weight and all this like, oh, I got to get all this stuff done. And, you know, I had this thing of like, okay, if I can just get through this season, like, okay, then I can get on to life. You know, all this stuff's happening right now. If I can just get through this, just get past it, then things will be good. And God was like, but I put you here right now for this reason. So I want to encourage you, like, I feel like that's what he's saying to everyone right now. Like, you might have so much stuff going on, and you're like, oh, I just wish this was over. And God's saying, like, I put you right here, right now for this purpose. And, like, that night, someone needed some huge encouragement. <laughs> so guess what? I was like, all right, let's start talking. You know, that's what we're here for. Let's, when there's so, too much stuff going on, you're not going to get it all done anyway. So just start somewhere and just start working. And it's not just getting stuff off a to-do list. Usually it's involving people. Like, hey, let's talk. What's going on? Why are you upset? I'm here to talk. 
And most of the time, here's my problem, like I want to fix. Most, I'd say like, you know, they typically say most men are fixers, like tell me your problems and I'll tell you the answer, how to, how to fix it. <laughs> That's usually my first instinct. But most of that conversation was like, yeah, that is really hard. And what do you want to do? What are you going to do? You know, not offering solutions, but just like, I'm here with you. You know, a lot of times people don't need a, you need to do this. They need a like, hey, I'm here with you while you're going through this. So again, that's another thing where it just seems, oh yeah, that's so simple and that's easy to say, but like that's what people need. Like who, who could use that in their life? <laughs> Who's going through some stuff that it would be great if someone was just like, hey, I'm here with you. I can't fix it, but I can go through it with you. So I am like way off my notes. <laughs> so I'm just going to skip down a little bit. There's some questions we can ask ourselves if we're a disciple, who are we following? You know, are we following the news? Are we following Fox News, CNN? Are we following social media, celebrity influencers? Those aren't people we should be following, right? But we get equipped by the people who we follow. So there's nothing wrong with watching the news or being on social media. I do all that. But we can't be getting equipped through them. Um, and the, these questions came from a, a mentor of mine, so I... I'll give him credit. Question two, are you empowered by purpose? It says in scriptures, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. It says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. That's our purpose. Are we empowered by our purpose? And the third question is, am I engaged in ministry? Like I said, in 2 Corinthians, we're given the ministry of re reconciliation. 2 Peter says we're called to be a kingdom of priests. It's not just about position, it's about action, right? So I don't know exactly how this all fits in for everybody, but I wanted to share on this. So <clears throat> has anyone ever heard of Chris, Chris Hogan? He's like a Dave Ramsey guy. He wrote the book Everyday Millionaires. Mm -hmm. um, fantastic book. They did a, sur a survey of 10,000 millionaires, and basically like they dispel all the myths. Like you think, oh yeah, they're just really rich people who inherited all their money, and it's like, no, most people worked really hard, saved, didn't get into debt. It's just like a really encouraging book. But in that book, he talks about that there's four relationships that all successful people need. And I felt like, you know, in his book, he talks about on the path to being a millionaire, you need these four relationships. But I thought for us tonight, I wanted to talk about it because on our path to being a good disciple of Jesus Christ, we need these four relationships. So if you want to write this down, this will be, this will be helpful. Like this is probably the most actionable thing I've talked about. The first relationship we need to be a good disciple is a coach. So a coach is someone who's hard on us, right? Has anyone ever played organized sports? Yeah, right? Your coach, you love them, but it's not because they're easy on you and tell you, like, you're doing such a great job. <laughs> coach, what do I need to change? Nothing. You're perfect, right? That's your, that's your mom on the sideline, right? <laughs> It's like when you go to the clothing store, you can't trust what your mom said. Like, do I look good in this shirt? Like, oh, honey, of course you look good. And you're just like, okay, oh, I can't. I don't know if I actually look good in this shirt. That's what you have to say, right? Your mom will always be super friendly, tell you the best things about you. Your coach will be honest with you. Your coach is the someone who stands on the sidelines and who challenges you to make progress. So again, as you're being a disciple, this isn't someone who's like, you know, your best bud at work who's in it with you. This would be someone who's in a different context but can relate with you. So they're on the sidelines being able to challenge you. They're also the same person that when you fall, they're yelling at you to get back up because they love and care about you. So I'd say the coach is the person who can give you that tough love. So if you're at home, if you can uh, think who your coach is, right now, give me, a, give me a high fives emoji. Can you think of anybody right now in, in the church here who might be your coach? If you don't have one, now's a good time to find one. Seriously, pray for somebody like, hey, can you just speak into my life a little bit? That's the greatest thing that's helped me grow is having people who could hold me accountable and speak into my life. So first relationship is a coach. Second was mentor. A mentor is someone who has done what you want to do. So this is someone who's on the journey that you are, but they're just like a few miles ahead or a few steps ahead. So as we go through this, I want you to think, you know, who is this person in my life? 
And then I also want to encourage you, who in whose life can I be this person? So if you really want to grow as a disciple, yes, you have to read your Bible. Yes, you have to be connected to the church, all that stuff. I'm not, I'm not discounting that. But I would say to really grow as a disciple, we need to be connected community. And the best way we do that is by having these relationships with other people, but also being these relationships to other people. Okay, so coach is someone who stands on the sidelines. Mentor is someone who's been where you are, and they're a little bit ahead. So I want you to think, who can you mentor? And again, you might be thinking, like, well, I'm... <laughs> There's probably like 28 better mentors I could think of right now who could be better than me. But the thing about being a mentor is it's someone who's a little bit ahead of you. So even if you're only a few steps down your Christian walk, you are ready. And as a matter of fact, like you couldn't have a mentor who's like a million miles ahead of you. You know, like it would be hard for me to have a mentor who's like, you know, the head of the denomination. I'm like, okay, I can't, I can't relate to, you know, the administrative bishop of the Church of God. Like I'm sure he's wonderful, but I'm like, wow, that'd be... He's so far ahead of me. Like, I need a good mentor who's, you know, a pastor who's a few steps ahead of me that can give me that same advice. You know, someday maybe. But um, So think about who, who can you be that for as well? Like, hey, I'm just new. I'm starting to walk in my faith. I'm finally getting my life together. It's like, perfect. Someone who's a disaster is looking at you like, oh, my gosh. If I could get where, where you are, that would be amazing. <laughs> so that's the second one. The third one is a cheerleader. So this is someone who believes in you and is there to encourage you no matter what. So think of this as this is someone who's usually done the hard work already. So a cheerleader, again, they believe in you and they encourage you no matter what. So this is the voice, too, that's like, hey, it's all right. Like, oh, no, you don't understand. I, I ran out of the gates and fell flat on my face. I embarrassed myself. Or, you know, I tried to talk to this person at work and they just looked at me like I was, had three heads. It's like, oh, that's okay. Like, we've all done that. Like, if you're not messing up, you're probably not trying hard enough. Like, that's what, you know, that's what the cheerleader is supposed to tell you. And the fourth one, and this might sound surprising, but is a friend. And a friend is a someone who reminds us that life is about more than just building wealth. That's what he says. So this is, a friend is someone who gives you that bigger context that can, can give you that perspective and pull you out of just the narrow focus of what you're doing. So again, a friend is someone who can give you that perspective. They remind us who we are and where we come from. And this is supposed to be someone who you've had a good, stable relationship with for like a while. So does that help anybody? When, when I was going through that, I was like, oh, I wonder who all these four are for me. And, and the thing that, again, really challenged me was, like, who can I be these for? You know, who can I mentor? Who can I be a friend for? So as, we're, as I'm wrapping up here, there's a couple different, different scriptures. Mark 16, verse 14. So this is the end of the book of Mark. It says, Later he appeared to the eleven, and they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And this is Jesus. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And then this is an interesting part. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Verse 19. So then after that, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through accompanying signs. So that's Mark 16. That's kind of like his version of the Great Commission, right? <laughs> I was like, man, there's some powerful stuff in there. Like, obviously, we're not, a, we're not like snake bite Pentecostals. <laughs> there will not be snakes. <laughs> if there are, I'll leave the room. I do not like snakes. But, you know, it says the same thing. Like, it's not like we're going to drink deadly poison. But God's saying, like, hey, if this stuff happens to you, if there's sick people, we can lay hands on them, and they're going to be healed. This is, this is, you know, kind of the perspective shifting thing. Like, what if, what if God said this, and he meant it? You know, what if he said, like, hey, I'm going to go with you, and you'll have this power as you witness and disciple other people? And I thought, what if we believed it? (laughs) 
Like, how would that change how we act? So I wanted to finish with this. Like I said, being, being, the, being a disciple, walking out the life of a dis- disciple can be a little bit different than we think. And again, like the impact we have in the lives around us, the influence we can have, like those coffee beans, changing the atmosphere, being the thermostat. Sometimes it looks like just being with people. Yes, it means we'll preach the gospel to people. When bad stuff happens, we can witness about our faith. You know, people are saying, why aren't you freaking out? Why aren't you worried about what's going on in the markets? Or why aren't you worried about this? Or aren't you worried about we're going to lose our jobs if this happens? And you can say, no, I don't. I work here, but I don't work for here. I work for God. So if I get laid off tomorrow, I know God's going to provide. Like, we'll get those opportunities. It's not always, like I said, not like going to Africa and building orphanages. Um, I wanted to read an, uh, one last quote from A.W. Tozer. And this is him talking, like, talking about another book. So he says, Nicholas Herman, who is commonly known as Brother Lawrence, was a simple dishwasher in the institution where he lived. So he was a monk. He said he did those dishes for the glory of God. I like that. <laughs> Mainly if I could tell a little story, like I started out working in a restaurant and I've washed dishes. First of all, it is not, hard, it is not easy. Anybody ever wash dishes in a restaurant? Right? I did it, it was like the middle of July, 97 degrees. I'm standing and you know, lifting the thing and it's like steaming heat. Like I've never sweated so much in, a, in my life. <laughs> like I have been soaked head to, toe, <laughs> head to toe washing dishes. So that really just stood out to me. But he continues. He said he did those dishes for the glory of God. When he was through with his humble work, he would fall down flat on the floor and worship God. Whatever he was told to do, he did it for the glory of God. He testified, I wouldn't do, I wouldn't as much as pick up a straw from the floor, but if I did it for the glory of God. It's like, wow, that really challenges me. <laughs> I know it's, this is a busy season for all of us, that there's so many things going on. But I wanted to encourage you that no matter what you're doing, don't quit now, right? Don't give up and quit. I know it might seem mundane in the middle, but if we bring that perspective that, hey, like right now I'm being faithful and I'm doing this for God, it can be something as washing the dishes. And to be honest, I hate washing dishes, but I still wash dishes, right? If I'm going to do it for the glory of God. So it might be at your job, like, hey, God's called me to do this big fancy thing, or I know God wants me to do this be in ministry or work in this other place or have this influence, if you're staying faithful to what you're doing right now, you're fulfilling that calling. Just like Pastor Jay is preaching about David, right? He got anointed and then he had to wait. (laughs) He was the king of Israel tending sheep, (laughs) right? And that's exactly what we're called to do as disciples. But like I said, God, and this this is my closing thought, God's not just a promise maker. He's a promise keeper. He's gonna do what he said. All right. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word tonight. God, I pray that all my rambling thoughts and words that I've spoken out tonight would touch people's hearts, that the seed of your word would take root, and that it would fall in good ground and bring forth a harvest of righteousness. God, I thank you that even though these are troubling times, you aren't troubled. God, that even though things are shaking in this world, you remain unshaken. So God, in the midst of everything going on, we trust you. We remain patient in trials, and we're going to stay put if you tell us to stay put, and we're going to be patient and trust you. And God, when you tell us to move forward, we're going to be obedient in your word, and we're going to trust you and walk in faith, knowing that what you've called us to do you've empowered us to do. God, knowing that everything that we've went through has empowered us and equipped us to walk forward into the destiny that you've called us to. So God, I pray tonight that for every disciple, every leader in this room, God, first of all, I just thank you for them. I thank you for my brothers and sisters that they are faithful. God, I just pray for an anointing from the Holy Spirit that they could walk forth into their lives and do the work of ministry that you've equipped them to do. 
God, just like Pastor asked us to be mindful and open and looking for opportunities, God, I pray opportunities would be presented to everyone here to share their faith. That people who are looking and hungry for the word would seek and find all these people out. And God, I thank you that where there's great darkness, your light shines forth. So God, again, I just thank you for for every person in this room and every person watching online. And I thank you that we can do simple things, but if we do them for your glory, it's what we're supposed to do. So God, I thank you for every opportunity to wash dishes, for every opportunity to listen to a friend who's struggling. I pray for more of those to come forward so that there's more opportunities for us to build your kingdom. And I thank you for that tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. God bless everybody.